All right, now that's white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. I'm not saying they're superior. I'm not saying that. Shem, superior. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. They're a superior race. It's the Jew. It's not the European. But now, I draw this map here to show you something very strange. You believe the Bible. The Bible's written down in here. You accepted Christ. Christ came down in here. Isn't it strange all Europeans got all tangled up with Shem? Those are Orientals down there. You know what they call that place there? They call it the Near East. You know what they call this thing right here in the Bible? They call it Asia. You call it Asia Minor. The Bible calls it Asia. Now, how do you account for the fact you got so mixed up with something down there in the Orient? The Lord said, Japheth shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Now, down here is where your religion started. If you're a Christian at all, you start there. You start Jerusalem, uh, city of the great king, Mount Zion. You have a Bible. Your Bible is an English Bible. It comes from up here around London. Now, if you draw a line from London down to Jerusalem, like I've drawn there, every important event that ever happened in the world was determined within 200 miles of that line. And there isn't any way to get around. There isn't any way to beat around the bush and say, well, discrimination, well, racial, well, just a bunch of stupid, prejudiced, blind bigots don't have good sense. The fact of the matter is, history is determined by that line. What time is it? According to who? What's Eastern Standard based on? Greenwich. Right on the line. Now, you may have some prejudiced bigots that think all people are the same, but they're crazy. Your watch is set by wasp time. In other words, if you're a male, say, or a communist, or a Chinese, your time is set by my watch. And my watch is set by Greenwich, and zero line runs through Greenwich, England. Not Peking, not Moscow, not Rome. And if I want to find what time it is in the world's history, I surely wouldn't fool around with Rome, and I surely wouldn't fool around with Moscow or Peking. I'd go to London if I was going to get it. I'd go to Big Ben sitting up there. All right, now, if you draw a line from where your origin started in Palestine, draw that line to London, England, that line just happens to be accidentally the line of revival, reformation, soul-winning, and Bible-believing people. And the Lord plainly discriminated against Spain and Italy when he did that. And because of that, Spain and Italy have never had a real revival for 1,600 years and never will. And if you want to see how Spain and Italy come out, go down to South America or Mexico and do missionary work. You see how it goes. Folks in Mexico and South America, those places that came in this area over in here, came from a place that God bypassed. When the Holy Spirit moved, he moved right slap through there. He moves northwest is his direction. And you come down here with the beginning with the Bible, of any part of your Bible, and come up here to Eon Paisley in North Island, and I've written over here in a small print some of the things that happened on that line. And if you draw a line with 200 miles that line, which roughly will be out in here someplace, well, it'll, my map is a little bit uh, off, <laughs> but you get a good map. I just drew that from memory. I had nothing to go by. But you take a thing and run it 200 miles either side of that line, and you'll hit every important event that ever happened in the world. World War I, World War II started right on that line, right on the button. The League of Nations, the United Nations, right on that line, Geneva, Switzerland. That is, any decision that's made that affects your life by the Health, Education, Welfare Department when you're trying to set up your school here is going to be governed by UNESCO in the United Nations. See? In front of the world spins on that thing right there. Somebody says, Mayo would say he's a communist. Well, if he got his communism, he got it from a German Jew named Karl Marx, right on that line. If it's on that line, that's it. Now, you know why that's so important? Because that's where you got your Bible from. You got your Bible on that line. You did not get your Bible from Chicago and New York. You didn't get your Bible from uh, the Lockman Foundation. You didn't get your Bible from America. America has never been known for anything but religious trash. <laughs> Have you ever stopped to think how many religions that originated in America were worth shooting? Name me one. The Baptists didn't come from America, they came from Europe. The Methodists didn't come from America, they came from Europe. The Presbyterians didn't come from America, they came from Europe. The Episcopalians didn't come from America, they came from Europe. See, Europeans get over here and lose the moorings. The Catholics didn't come from here, they came from Europe. There was a time when the Catholics were pretty sound in the faith, about 18 centuries back. <laughs> uh, did you know every religion ever started in America was a, was a wipeout? Jehovah Witness? America, Seventh-day Adventism, America, 
Mormonism, America, Church of Christ, America, modern charismatic movement, America. Can a good thing come out of America? No, not spiritually. <laughs> I mean, our country majors in material. God shall enlarge Japheth. If you want something spiritual, you sure wouldn't come to America looking for it. I was in a, in a uh, you said, well, how come we have more missionaries because we got more money? Now, you get Americans saved, Americans supply over half the missionary money in the world, which is good, I'm all for it. But what we go over there and teach those people didn't originate here, it originated way, way, way back yonder. It didn't originate here. All right, now you want to keep that line in mind, we talk about the King James Bible, keep in mind three places, Antioch of Syria, where the disciples are first called Christians, Acts 11. Antioch of Syria, where the first missionary trip comes from, Acts 13. Antioch of Syria, where the spirit-filled deacons come from, in Acts chapter 6, right there. Alexandria, Egypt, remember that place. What is Egypt a type of in the Word of God? It's a picture of the world. Do you know God never leaves anybody in Egypt? Moses went down to Egypt, and the Lord said, Come out. Joseph went down to Egypt, and the Lord said, Get his bones out. Jacob went down to Egypt, and God said, Get his bones out. I don't want his bones in Egypt. Jesus Christ went down there when he was a baby, and the Bible said, Out of Egypt I have called my son. If there's one place God don't want you, it's in Egypt. Amen. And did you know my bones aren't going to stay in Egypt? If that, <laughs> hey! Amen. If they bury me, my bones are going to be raptured and caught out. <laughs> did you know not one of Christ's bones was left in Egypt? If you could find his fingernail, I'd quit preaching tonight. But you ain't going to find it. Because they've gone up. <laughs> All right, now that's Egypt, type of this world. Any Bible that comes from there is a worldly Bible. Alexander, Egypt. Now here's what we call a Western type of text, Greek text, over in Rome. Rome in the Bible is quite an outfit. Rome in the Bible murders babies, Herod, Matthew chapter 2, kills Christians, cut off James' head, Acts chapter 12, throws them in jail, Acts chapter 12, cuts off Paul's head, 2 Timothy 4, whips Jesus Christ, and then nails him. That's quite an outfit to go around talking about blessed Jesus, blessed Joseph, blessed John the Baptist. That's quite an outfit. And you know, when the Bible defines these terms, the Bible believer will listen. Now, the reason some of you maybe kind of think I'm kind of prejudiced is because you never really believed the book to start with and you didn't pay too much attention to it. When the Bible says certain things about Rome, those things are true. It isn't just talking. When the Bible says certain things about Egypt, you don't say, well, that's, you know, that's Paul's opinion, and I partially agree with him. <laughs> I mean, when that book says certain things are true about a certain place, it's true. All right, now keep in mind that line as we turn to the next chart. I'm going to leave that chart with you, and you can spend eight or nine years studying it and try to figure things out. <laughs> and Vietnam and Korea were set up after World War II. So if you want to know where Vietnam and Korea start, they don't start the Pacific. They start right there. They start with Churchill and Roosevelt and Stalin getting together at Tehran and Yalta and setting up Vietnam and Korea. That is, anything that affects your life is on that line. All right, now, on this chart here, I've tried to condense about 108 hours in one thing where you can see it, and I'll only talk about the general things on it. I won't have time to get specific about everything on there. For example, this material found in this sheet here, in that square there, and that square there, and those purple names, is about 36 hours study. So we're not going to take a lot of time with it, but the general things. Now let's start up from where you are. Uh, you start up here in, uh, where are you, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Yeah, where in the world is that? <laughs> an independent Baptist church. What's an independent Baptist church? Bible-believing church. What's it got? It's got a Bible. There's the Bible. Holy Bible. Oh, here's a Bible. Right outside these doors, you've got 57 different Bibles. Your kinfolk got them. The in-laws got them. The in-laws have living Bibles, Good News for Modern Man, New English Bible, New ASV, ASV, RV, Mickey Mouse, Peanuts, Charlie Brown, Weymouth, Moffat, Good Speed, Tarzan, The Green Hornet, and all that stuff there. And the question comes up, what's the Bible? Billy Graham gets on the radio and says, The Bible says, which Bible? The 57 of them in English. Every time they put on a new Bible, they say, We need to update it. Well, you dirty four flushing hypocrites, you're lying. You may tell me the English language has gotten archaic 57 times in 70 years. Much a cheap bunch of rotten crooks. Very idea, it's not eight months from the day they'll put on a new version. 
and say to make it clear. Clear than what? You've had 57 clearer ones in 70 years, 57 of them. You mean you haven't got it yet? <laughs> Isn't it amazing how some old uh, dumb country hillbilly hick preacher like Brother Smith, <laughs> or myself, sir, or myself, can get so much out of this book, this archaic dead book nobody can understand? And it is amazing how much of these campfire girls have these new Bibles, how little they can understand it. Does that strike you as kind of funny? Do you know the key to understanding the Bible is not necessarily just how low down you drag it? The key to understanding the Bible is the author. The Bible said then he opened their understanding. They might understand the Scripture. But a private, no Scripture prophecy the Scripture is any private interpretation. The holy man of God is fake as they move by the Holy Ghost. Joseph said, Do not interpretations belong to God? The natural man receiveth not the things of God, for they are foolish unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. Uh, I grant you the book should be plain enough language so you can get it, but anybody can get out of there what they ought to get. They lie about it. They say, I don't understand the Bible. Who does? I've read the Bible through 78 times. I don't understand all of it. And I, I can read Greek and Hebrew. If I can read Greek and Hebrew and read this thing through 78 times and I don't understand it, you think you're going to understand it by buying a living Bible? <laughs> See how folks are? I mean, you know, you know what they're trying to say? They're trying to say, I have to understand all of it. No, you don't. And you couldn't anyway. If you, if you understood all that book, you'd know somebody just as dumb as you wrote it. Amen? Amen. Well, sure. Uh, folks say, a fellow said to me one time down in Pensacola, he said, you know anybody who knows the Bible any better than you do? I said, well, that's a pretty unfair question to ask a fellow. He said, well, don't give me any false humility. Do you know anybody that does? I said, yes, sure, probably a lot of them. He said, name one. No, I said, the devil. He never even thought about that, did he? <laughs> now, I'll tell you, there's plenty in Zechariah I don't understand. And there's plenty in the Song of Solomon I don't understand. There's plenty. There's plenty in Ezekiel I don't understand. And there's some verse in 1 John I just not just soon not look at. <laughs> uh, now, now, what does that make me say? Well, it's just so hard to understand. I have to get a Bible in one language. No, no, uh, no. The thing we do is believe what God gave me and pray about it. That's what to do. All right, now you're on all these versions come along here. Now, somebody's wrong and somebody's right. And uh, the consistent Christian will have to fight this problem out. Now, a lot of Christians are indifferent, lazy, and inconsistent. They won't fight it out. I don't say anybody use a different Bible wicked than not. I don't say, when, I don't say Billy Graham recommend the living Bible. That proves an apostate. Don't say that. I don't say because they use a new ASB at Bob Jones or recommend the ASB at Arlington or Springfield. That means they're godless and liberal and modern. I never, never said that. I will say this. I'll say it's very inconsistent. It's inconsistent. One of our young men, we have in the mission field now, named Weldon Jones, a weightlifter, fine kid. He's up in Germantown, Ohio. And a real character. I mean, he's tough and brave, just bold as a lion, that kid. He witnessed a guy in his, <clears throat> on the bench where he worked at the Naval Air Station, tool bench, witness to him every day, every day. And after about three months, that guy went crazy. He went berserk at the bench. He got throwing tools around, <laughs> kicking off the tool chest and screaming and saying, we're all dirty, we're all filthy, we're all going to hell, I can't stand it, hell is and hell, I'm just screaming, you know. The, and the boss came around and said, what's the matter? He said, this guy always talking about hell and the same, we're all sinful, we're all wicked, we're all filthy. He said, either this guy goes or I go. And the boss said, okay, you go, and fired him. <laughs> and Walden Jones went up to, he went up to BRM, uh, Baptist uh, International Mission in Chattanooga, Lee Robertson and Seitler and, and Tom Freedy and some of them. He got up there and Lee Robertson said, uh, where'd you go to school? Walden Jones said, Pensacola Bible Institute. And he said, how much that junk at Ruckman teaches you swallowing you're down there? Ray Robertson says. And our young man said, as much as I could, if I could, I got some more. <laughs> and about that time, Robertson started to say something, and Tom Freeney stepped in and said, now, never mind, Dr. Robinson, we'll take care of this, we'll handle it, you know. And he and Seidler stepped in there and stood up for the King James. And one of the other men sitting there at the table said, well, uh, are you going to knock people for using the ASB in the mission field? And Weldon said, no, I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to stick by the King James. And the fellow said, well, don't you believe other translation of the Word of God, too? And Weldon said, I believe the Bible is the Word of God. I don't believe it contains the Word of God. I believe it is. Yeah. That's what they ask all the ministers before they ordain them. And the fellow said, well, don't you believe the ASV is the Word of God, too? And Weldon said, well, look here. 
He said, if this book says one thing and the ASV says another, they both can't be the Word of God. They read different. Now, did you know a consistent Christian has to face that problem? Now, I gave you some verses here yesterday morning we met. I gave you about 21 of them to show you how to tell whether you've got a Bible that comes from this line or a Bible that comes from that line. or two lines of Bibles. And if you've got a Bible that reads as these Bibles here do, then you've got the right book. And if you've got one that reads as these do, you've got the wrong book. Or else, these books are right and these ones are wrong. Now, I'll be consistent with you. I won't say I'm right. I'll say, one is right, one wrong. Now, one of them's heads and one of them tails. And a fellow said, a fellow said, well, how do you want to settle it? Well, I'll go by the infallible law of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, by their fruits you shall know them. Amen? All right, now with that orientation, we'll start. Well, that's your Bible was first written by Peter, Jane, and John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Jude, and Paul, and the original manuscripts, which we no longer have. The reason why you have, no longer have the original manuscripts is the original manuscripts are written what they call papyrus. That's our word for paper. Papyrus was a cheap paper, much cheaper than this. The nearest thing to papyrus you have today is newsprint out of a newspaper. And can you imagine the shape those original manuscripts were in by the time they've been copied by hand by 25,000 Christians all over that country? You see my Bible here? This is an old Bible. This Bible here is maybe, oh, this Bible comes out maybe about 15 years, and you understand I'm using two other Bibles with this one. I don't use this one full time. This is just a study Bible. My sermon Bible is a big one. That thing there is torn all to pieces and patched and repatched and cut up and the pages are turning brown in it and that book right there with those pages are turning brown is India paper, the highest quality paper they make. And I'm not bragging. It probably should be a lot more beat than that. But I'm telling you this. If a Bible used by one man can get beat up like that in 10 or 15 years and the best paper you can get, can you imagine what shape those manuscripts were in on newsprint? copied hand-to-hand, -hand, folded, smuggled, rain weather, hot weather, Paul a day and the night in the deep. Do you have his parchments with him <laughs> out there in the water, <laughs> written in jail? Can you imagine the condition those things were in after, say, a hundred years? That's why you can't find a complete Old Testament or, or complete original manuscripts. The reason why you can't find them is they're just flat worn too. Every now and then they find one little piece of them. For example, one time they found a little piece of paper about this big, life size, and they label it P52. They give numbers to the piece of paper and they find them. It's called P1, P2, P3, P4, so forth and so on. P52, Papyrus 52. A little old piece of paper, it's about that big, contains part of John 18. And that's the oldest piece they ever did find, part of John 18. When the young men left Bob Jones University uh, this spring of 74, Dr. Custer, the head of the Bible department at Bob Jones University, slipped the four-page Xerox sheet into each one of the mailboxes of the assistant graduates who were going to stay and teach. And that four-page sheet stuck in the assistant graduate's box said the Alexandrian text was the correct text, and people who believed in this had an inflated opinion and were slandering the memory of the dead. And then it said that P-52 in that in that four-page sheet, was an Alexandrian manuscript, the oldest that ever found. Dr. Custer is a liar. And if you see him, tell him I said so, and he knows where I'm at. He's got my name and address. My telephone number is 476-7934. That's not a manuscript. That's a fragment. And you can't take a piece of paper that big and classify it as Alexandrian or here for certain because there's not enough on that paper to classify it. One well, old Griesbach and Lachman and these fellows, these old German scholars, began to divide the Greek manuscripts off into families, Western, Alexandrian, and Syrian. They graded them by the fact that certain families of manuscripts had a certain readings characteristic of those families. You couldn't get enough readings in a piece of paper that big to make it characteristic of nothing. Line again, eh, doctor? <laughs> All right, so you have these two lines to come down through here. This Bible is written on Greek papyrus, Small, cheap paper, Corne Greek. What is Corne Greek? Common Greek, ordinary Greek, street talk. I'll give you a difference between Corne and classical. This junk down here is written in classical Greek on vellum scrolls. This is classical Greek text, and it's not written on paper. It's written on tanned, 
animal hide called vellum. I'll give you the difference. Uh, here is here is corn egg reek. Three blind mice, three blind mice. See how they run, see how they run. They all ran after the farmer's wife who cut up a tail with a butcher knife. You ever see such a thing in your life? There's three blind mice. That's corn egg. Now I'll give you classical. A trio of sightless rodents, a trio of sightless rodents. <laughs> Perceive the unusual manner which they proceed to scamper about. They hastily pursued the agricultural spouse who proceeded to sever the extremity with a carving utensil. <laughs> In all your natural born days of existence, did you ever perceive such unusual occurrence a trio of cypress rodents? That's what that is. <laughs> all right, so you've got classical Greek coming down here, you've got corn egg on up there. Now, right at the very start, at the origination of these two texts, we see a radical difference in how things are going to go. For example, when this thing starts up here, it starts at Antioch of Syria. Take your Bible to Acts chapter 11. Read me verse 26. The Corne Greek of the New Testament starts at Antioch of Syria, according to the New Testament. According to the New Testament, the first time a Christian shows up is not at Jerusalem and not at Alexandria. Acts 11, 26. Somebody read it. Yes. There you go. Now, if I'm looking for a Christian's Bible, I better go look and see where the Christians started from. They start in Antioch of Syria. They don't start in Alexandria, Egypt. Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, somebody read me verse 1. Acts 13, verse 1. That's it. That's it. N-I-G-E-R means black for Nigeria. It's Latin for black. All right, now see that thing in 13.1? Prophets and teachers. See that thing? Now I'm looking for any Bible prophet and Bible teacher who's a Christian. I'm not going to go to Rome. I'm going to go by the Word of God. I'm supposed to believe that book. And if I'm looking for prophets and teachers, I'm going to go to for I'm going to look for a Greek text that comes out of Antioch of Syria because that's the Christian text. That's where I'm going to go. Uh, Paul, if you look at 13 there, look down at verse 2, 3, and 4. And notice the first missionary trip to the Gentiles comes from that church by the apostle to the Gentiles who wrote nearly one-third of the New Testament. See that thing there? Now, why would I go to Alexandria looking for Greek manuscripts? Wouldn't that be a dumb thing to do? If I wanted to get Greek manuscripts, I'd get them from the Syrian church in Antioch if I was going to get the right thing. Or oh, now, as soon as the New Testament is completed, and these fellows write, somebody begins to mess with that book. For example... Turn to 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians chapter 2, somebody read me the last two verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the last two verses. Now this is before the New Testament is even complete. Somebody read it. Get the wrong place. We are not as what? Many. Not as what? Many. Many. Go ahead. Which corrupt the word of God. Well, well, well. Go ahead. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. There are many corruptors. They had one or two false versions. There are many of them. And that's before that New Testament is complete. Somebody's messing with that book. Now, for example, if you have any Roman Catholic friends, you might ask them what they're doing with seven books in their Bible that are not in your Bible. Somebody's corrupting that Old Testament before that New Testament is complete. And Paul says many are corrupting that thing. So a Roman Catholic has in his Bible Tobit, Bell and the Dragon, Judith, Ecclesiasticus, the Wisdom of Solomon, an addition on uh, Esther, and First uh, and Second Maccabees. He got seven books you don't have in your Bible. Now the Lord Jesus Christ never quoted one of those books. And the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 23 said an Old Testament begins with Abel and ends with the slaying of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom they slew between the temple and the altar. Matthew 23. Jesus Christ said an Old Testament begins with Genesis and ends with Second Chronicles. And if you go down to a Jewish synagogue in this town, look at their Bible, it begins with Genesis and ends with Second Chronicles. If you go to a synagogue in this town, the Old Testament has the Law, the Torah, the Prophets, the Nabim, and the Writings, the Kethubim. And the Kethubim end with Second Chronicles. Every Orthodox Jew in Fort Wayne, Indiana, has an Old Testament divided into three parts. The Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. And the books that are in an Orthodox Jewish synagogue are the books found in a King James 1611 authorized version. Minus none, plus none. 
Now, your King James Version may arrange in a different order, but the same number of books down to the exact book that an Orthodox Jew wrote and the oracles of God were delivered to Israel, the Jew, are found in the King James Bible, and they're not found in the Catholic Bible. The Catholic Bibles have these books stuck into the Old Testament, in addition. All right, as soon as that New Testament is written, the scholars get a hold of it. These are the scholars. And these scholars, most of them professing Christians. Professing Christian, professing Christian, professing Christian, professing Christian. Professing Christian. This one's not, this one's not, this one's not, this one's not. And this one's profession is really <laughs> pretty comical. <laughs> I mean, uh, Constantine, you know, Easter bunnies, you know, and Christmas trees and all that stuff. And then uh, right before he died, he was sprinkled on his bed, you know, real sound in the face. And this fellow here is a close shave. <clears throat> That's a church historian, good friend of Constantine's. And he appeared at the Council of Nicaea and was in favor of compromising the deity of Christ. But professing Christians. If you went to any school, I suppose, in the face of this earth, except our little cement block building down south, you'd be taught these two fellows here, two of the greatest people that ever lived. And undoubtedly, you'd be taught that that fellow there was the most brilliant, refined, excruciating scholar that ever lived. Uh, the standard church history written for all church histories is Philip Schaff's eight volumes history of the Christian church. And Philip Schaff had nothing but unmitigated praise for Origen and Augustine. Philip Schaff was an amillennial baby sprinkler who rejected the word of God. Of course, he was saved. There are a lot of saved people that reject the word of God. Amen. Well, I take your Bible and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Somebody read me verse 13. Oh. Now, the word of God doesn't work effectually to man that doesn't believe it. If all you believe is the virgin birth, the bodily resurrection, the crucifixion, the second coming, you believe the fundamentals extracted from the word. You don't believe the word necessarily. Now, let's turn to Mark chapter 9. And somebody in Mark chapter 9, read me verse 11. Now, you know how you make that word of God an unaffect? By tradition. That's how you do it. That's how it's done. If that word where it's traditional to do a thing a certain way, you just reject what God has said and keep on doing it that way. All right, I hear this bunch come in and get a hold of this Bible, begin to make copies of it. They copy it on tan animal hide. Two of those manuscripts remain. They're called Vaticanus the signified in critical apparatus by the number B, Sinaiticus, signified in the critical apparatus by the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. Now those two manuscripts right there contain the Apocrypha as part of the Old Testament, and the New Testament they have a book called The Shepherd of Hermas, and the Epistle of Barnabas, and First and Second Clement. Whenever you like to stand and give us your favorite verse from the Epistle to Barnabas, <laughs> or The Shepherd of Hermas, and when Dr. Custer at Bob Jones University said the Alexandrian text the most authoritative, he was telling you the manuscript that contained Hermas and Barnabas in the New Testament was more authoritative than the King James Bible. He's a crook. Amen. You see him, tell him I said so, knows where to get a hold of me. He wants to take it to court, we'll go to court. I can prove anything I'm saying. You want photostatic copies of the manuscripts? I got them. I got them. All right, you come down to here, and here's Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, 1st, 2nd Clement, and these manuscripts. These manuscripts were copied out by Eusebius for Constantine. Constantine sent Eusebius a note, and said, send me 50 copies of the New Testament. Eusebius said, yes, sir, coming right up. And he sent him 50 copies, and these two here are probably two copies that survive out of the 50 made for Constantine, probably. When Jerome translated his Latin Vulgate, he was wise in the Old Testament. He translated the Hebrew Old Testament from the Hebrew. But when he got to the New Testament, he used this junk right here. So Jerome's Latin Vulgate is basically these Greek manuscripts. Jerome's Latin Vulgate down through here. All right, the popes take over, the dark ages set in, the lights in the world go out. And as long as this text rules the world, you're in darkness. You know what that period of history is called in church history? It's called the dark ages. Whenever the church gets in power with a corrupt Bible, the shades of night fall and its lights out. And if Rome ever gets control of the United Nations and begins to use a new ASV recommended by Bob Jones, you had it. The new ASV is the Roman Catholic Latin Vulgate in English. Now this bunch of Greek manuscripts come down through here and these men begin to print editions of this Greek manuscript. The first man really upset the card is a man named Griesbach. Griesbach Schultz, Lachmann, Tischendorf, Germans. 
Uh, the trouble's going to come from Germany. <laughs> uh, I don't know how much German blood you've got in you, but Germans are a very peculiar people in that uh, <laughs> they're extreme conservatives. And the reason why they get so radical sometimes, like Adolf, is because they're so conservative that once they see a logical course of action, they carry it to a logical conclusion. There's something the German can't do. He can't get off the track of a thing when he gets on the track. And he can't let a proposition lie half to it. He'll have to push it, see? And uh, if, uh, if you want to know why uh, most of the... You want to know why Hitler set up what he did, it's real easy. Hitler was a consistent man. Darwin wasn't. Charlie Darwin was an Englishman. And Darwin got to go on evolution, but he didn't have enough guts to follow the thing through. You know the people who followed evolution through to, to the hilt? Haeckel, the German. Haeckel. Haeckel got a hold of that thing when the, when the Congress and Vienna of scientists got together back there in about 1890. Haeckel got up and said, the issue, gentlemen, is whether or not Darwin was right. And Haeckel was right. That's the issue. I mean, if you people are animals, we're on the wrong track. Do you know that? And if you're not animals, the other bunch is on the wrong track. And with all due regards to uh, the Jews, I mean, I love the Jewish people, and I bless them and take care of them, and I want my rewards in heaven. With all regards to the Jewish people, I'll say this for Adolf, he's a great deal more consistent than the people taught you high school. <laughs> I mean, the people taught you evolution in high school were not consistent. And the same way down at the University of Indiana, they teach evolution down there. Cenozoic period, Mesozoic period, Paleozoic, you know, uh, amoeba, paramecium, hydra, stegosaurus, brontosaurus, all that baloney and get that guy come, they, they can't press it to a logical conclusion. Hitler said, uh, well, the trouble is we need to uh, breed out the bad part and breed in the good part. Right. Do you gas animals? Do you gas animals? Don't you gas animals when they get old and get sick? Okay, gas people, that's right. Do you skin animals? Do you ever use the skin for anything? Let's well, skin the people, make lampshades out of them. And folks say, ah, oh, no, no man, no, ah. Oh. If Darwin is right, that's a... Uh, I mean, if Darwin's right, that's the way to do it. The thing is, uh, you know, these Englishmen, they're squeamish. They won't carry the thing on through the logical inclusion. You know, German take the thing all the way, boy, all the way. <laughs> and uh, when the German got a hold of higher criticism, he carried it all the way. Then never occur to you rather strange that one country was guilty of perhaps the, perhaps the worst, most terrible thing a country ever did, and that was the country that brought about the Reformation that got you saved? Well, the struck you kind of peculiar? You know, the Reformation came, it came from Germany, it didn't come from England. The Englishmen couldn't get a Reformation going. They wouldn't kick hard enough. <laughs> but German to kick. And so God says, if I want to turn the world upside down, get the Pope off and get a Reformation in, I'll take a German. And by the same token, the Lord said, if I want to persecute my people and murder them and kill them and burn them to make them go back to Israel, I'll use Germany again. Uh, part of the two most extreme characters that ever lived in history were both preachers. And they're both Germans. One of them was Adolf Hitler, one was Martin Luther. They both preached. Well, if you think Hitler didn't preach, you ought to see some of them films. I got records on Hitler preaching. Boy, he'll preach. Man, he'll scald the paint off a wall. Of course, he's preaching the wrong thing. <laughs> and, you know, the Germans have always had kind of a complex about it with the Englishmen. Uh, I know, I mean, if someone's... I'm fourth generation German, so I'm not, you know, I'm up in the old country. But I understand the, I understand the trouble. <laughs> let me, let me show you, I'll digress just a minute, I won't show you. I've got to show you this for the sake of the fatherland. <laughs> uh, you see, uh, <laughs> you see, back in 1400, <clears throat> out of something else, you get that thing, you see, where a German and a Frenchman are talking, the Frenchman says, how about making things right and dividing now size of the rain even? And the German said, listen, in 1352, <laughs> goes back there, see, 500 years if they get the trouble. Now, here's the trouble. You see, Germany is landlocked. And if you want to know why right now, why I'm using this instead of Luther's Heidegger Schrift, it's because God couldn't get the gospel to the end of the earth in Germany. It's landlocked. God had to get a seafaring nation to get it out. Now, German never forgive the Lord for that. <laughs> and that's a dirty trick. <laughs> I mean, anybody knows a German can outwork an Englishman. 
And it was just by my nose made in Germany up until World War II was a trademark guarantee you had the right stuff. My daddy was a German. If we didn't work a 14-hour day, we were loafing. Now, folks talk about eight-hour day. Man, if you didn't work a 14-hour day, you're lazy. My dad, in all the time I knew him, I never, he never complimented me for a job. I never heard him say, well done over anything I ever did. He gave me something to do, and I'd do it, and work my head off at it, and the next day come out and look at it, and say, well, do better next time. <laughs> That's a whole lot to it, you know, kind of thing. And anybody who knows anything about lenses and microscopes and atom bombs and electronics and cameras, they know where the skill is. So German feels bad about that. He has an inferiority complex about it. Hard to get over it. <laughs> I mean, anybody can tell the Deutschland all around the world. <laughs> but the Lord doesn't let them do it. <laughs> and every time they get ready to do it, you know who sacks them? England. Every time. I mean, did you know there's more kinship between these people than between these people? Anglo-Saxon. That's the kinship. Wouldn't you think England would take Germany's side in the war? With the same kin. You know, the war we get into, we take England aside, don't we? You know why? We're kin. Why do we fight against our kin folk in Germany? That's where we came from. But boy, you can't tell anybody anything. <laughs> and you take this thing every time Germany comes out of England and sacks it. Every time Germany sends out a ship, it has to go through the English Channel. Oh, that's bad, man. <laughs> that's bad. I mean, not much of the Channel is German. You can see that in the look. <laughs> and why isn't this the French Channel? Why is the English Channel? See? Now, if you want to know why God used that country to start a reformation, it's because that country is packed and oppressed and surrounded and persecuted. You never met a German in your life. You didn't have a persecution complex about something. When I go into a restaurant, I like to sit on the back of the wall. I can't stand to sit with an open space behind me or a window or a door. I get in the corner, they're coming to get me. <laughs> I mean, that's the way you always feel. That's the way that country feels because it's surrounded, you see. And God could start a reformation there because it's compressed. So that thing goes, whew, it goes out, Lord, this chair's thing is smithereens. But when God wanted to get to the end of the earth, he couldn't get it out from here. So he went over here. And that's the history in that thing. All right, there's the Germans first that begin to mess with your Bible, German scholarship. And these scholars are listed here. These fellows produce what we call the critical text. A critical text is a Greek New Testament. And if you went to Bob Jones, Tennessee Temple, Arlington, Fort Worth, Dallas, Moody, Fuller, Wheaton, Columbia, Viola, uh, any of them, they'd teach you out of Greek out of the Greek New Testament. The Greek New Testament they'd give you would be the Greek New Testament by uh, Nessel, German, or Arlington Metzger, German, or Westcott North, Englishman, who followed German scholarship. That Greek text is Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. And that Greek text matches the Roman Catholic Bible. Now, that could be proved in court. And if you ever seen in my, say, in my writing to say, in court, in court, in court, you might think this fellow has a chip in his shoulder just trying to get somebody to take him into court. I am. I've been, in, I've been dragged to circuit court eight times in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, I might lose the next one, haven't lost one yet. I've always got some really beloved friend in Christ who wants to get something out of my head. And I'll tell you right now, if you had to stand up in court and prove that your King James Bible is not that line of Bibles, and the living Bible is, it'd be just easy to just fall off a log. And let me tell you, the average unsaved judge is a lot more impartial about those things than Christians are. I know those are circuit court judges. I've been, they've gone off the Supreme Court of State of Alabama twice. And I'll tell you right now, that old unsaved judge will look at that thing and say, uh, What'd you say? You know, they're half asleep, looking out the window, you know, and fiddling with a watch. They, they know the lawyers are crooks, both of them. I know judge, a lot of judges sit up, yeah, man, they're real impartial. I don't find many judges down there giving the wrong decision. They either get it right. And the boy sit up there and he'll say, you say the, the, the Lompman Foundation says this Bible is true to the original Greek? That's what John R. I. said in the Sword of the Lord. And the Lompman Foundation said, yes, sir. The judge said, would you mind showing me the original Greek? Well, Your Honor, you see that, well, wait a minute, the statement said it's true to the original Greek. Do you have the original Greek? Well, Your Honor, these are, you don't have the original Greek? Well, do you have the original Greek? No, case dismissed. I saw them birds handle. Now, you take that dumb bunch of stupid Christians and sit around and say, well, good and godly men believed it. And Robertson and Macon and Tory were good and godly and dedicated out of court. 
You don't appeal to a godly man's wife to back up a lie. All right, now this bunch here corrupt. When I say that corrupt, I mean the whole thing, kit and caboodle, right on through. I'm not saying you can't buy those Bibles. It might be a good to study them to see how they corrupted the Word of God. <laughs> uh, you take a living Bible, it's got some things in it your kids probably can understand better than they could out of the King James, some things in it. I'd read that thing to my kids, maybe good news for devotional material, you know, and then read them something out of the Bible. <laughs> But I would never the mistake of tell, make a mistake of telling my kid those things were Bibles. They're not Bibles. That is just religious, devotional matter. They're slightly leavened, is what they are. All right, that's back line. Now across here, First Council, 325 A.D., Second Council, Roman Catholic, 1546, Federal Council of Churches, National Council of Churches, World Council of Churches, Council of Nicaea, 325 A.D., stated the fundamentals of faith for the fellow to believe. Minus a statement on the authority of the Word of God. Minus a statement on the premillennial coming of Christ. Minus a statement on soul winning. <laughs> 1546, a statement on the fundamentals of the faith. With an additional curse on a man that didn't believe the Apocrypha. A curse on a man that thought baptism didn't give you the new birth. A curse on a man that believed eternal security. The Council of Trent, 1546, says, Let him be anathema. 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 You people sitting right in this building in the Baptist Temple in Fort Wayne are cursed, according to the Roman Catholic Church. And if you don't believe that, then uh, you haven't looked and you haven't checked. And if your Catholic friends and relatives don't believe that, because they're stupid and blind and ignorant. Some of them may be good people, sweet people, courageous people, fine people, polite people, nice people, and ignorant Amen. and blind. The Council of Trent, 1546, pronounced a curse on every person in this building that believes in salvation by grace through faith plus nothing and that believes that baptism cannot save you. If you don't believe it, read the decrees, the Council of Trent. You see where I get them, public library, Catholic encyclopedia. Anybody in the state of Indiana can find out what the Roman Church has to say about independent Baptists. They're cursed. And if you think Pope Paul or Pope John ever reneged on that, then you didn't listen to Pope John and Pope Paul too carefully. All right, Federal Council of Churches, a liberal outfit, National Council of Churches. In Fort Wayne, Indiana, you probably have 40 to 50 churches along those two groups. More than that. Uh, usually your big downtown first churches are in that thing especially your Methodists, United Methodists, the whole outfit, the Glide Memorial Methodist Church, San Francisco, homosexual weddings, nude dancing in the pulpit, nudes plastered in the wall, dopers invited in for Sunday school, cigarette butts all over the auditorium. That's, that's one of them outfits, United Methodists. That's a bunch that sponsored Key 73. That's an ecumenical movement to get all the churches together. The potentates are Bishop Blake, Eugene Carson Blake, Bishop Pike, who's now dead, died of Satanists following seance and necromancy, uh, contacting the dead. Uh, that group published the RSV and the new RSV. They have Nels Ferre, who denied the virgin birth, Bishop Oxton, the Sockman, who denied the virgin birth, Norma Vincent Peel, who's an amateur hack, psychiatrist, psychologist. Uh, they have uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, Tillich, and all those fellows. And those fellows are trying to get all the world together into one church. We call that the ecumenical movement. Uh, Brother Smith does not belong to the ecumenical movement. Brother Smith is what's called independent Baptist. When you say independent, that means no counsel. No counsel. All right, that's this line. That's all negative. Now let's hit the positive. Top line. When the world was a Greek-speaking world, God had a Greek New Testament in Koine Greek from Antioch of Syria. When the world was a Latin-speaking world, God had an old Latin Bible throughout the Dark Ages used by the Christian martyrs who were burned at the stake and tortured and killed by Rome. The old Latin has 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 and 8 in it. So if they tell you at that school, 1 John 5, 7 and 8 don't belong there, you say, talk it over with those Christians who got burned at the stake. Your argument's with them, not the Greek scholars in Alexandria. When this world God wanted to start a reformation, he picked a German coal miner. Martin Luther's daddy was a coal miner in Eisenach, Germany and Mark and sing on the street. And when God wanted to do that, the Lord said, I'm going to have to pick a man that will carry it all the way. All the way. And Mark go all the way. <laughs> Mark write letters to the Pope and say, Most hellish father, greetings. 
and when he meet an, a cardinal, he'd say, greetings, your hellishness. <laughs> and and I, if you had a man like that as pastor here, you'd, you'd tar and feather him. That's right. The trouble with God's people today is they don't have any sense, no wisdom, no knowledge, no nothing. That Bible says, well, there's no vision, the people perish. You all know your European background. When God comes along that, he develops uh, Martin Luther, and Martin Luther translates the Greek Texas Receptus into a German Bible. If you ever get a hold of a copy, it's a good one. It's a good one. If I was going to a missionary to Germany, that's the one I'd use. I'd use Uber Zetson von Martin Luther. All right, then, when God wanted to get out the ends of the earth, he used an English Bible. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 3. There's a very good reason why the King James is superior to the original Greek. Very good reason. And it's given in the Bible. Somebody read me Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Revelation 3, verse 8. Read. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, what? and hast not denied my name. I give that last part. Kept my word. What church is that? Philadelphia. The church at Ephesus didn't keep it. The church at Smyrna didn't keep it. The church at Pergamos didn't keep it. The church at Thyatira didn't keep it. The church at Sardis didn't keep it. The church that kept it was the church of the open door, Philadelphia. I'll tell you something else. When you read those seven churches, there isn't one of those churches that doesn't get a rebuke except that sixth church, number six, Philadelphia. Every one of those churches gets a rebuke. I have somewhat against thee. I have somewhat against thee. I have somewhat against thee. You read that past in that church of Philadelphia, the Lord doesn't say one bad thing about that church. And that church has an open door. That's why I drew the line going up. See? I drew all those other lines coming down, and then up she goes. Now watch it drop off. Somebody read me Revelation chapter uh, 3, and read me Revelation chapter 3, verse... Uh, Here we go. Laodicea. See the symbol here, Laodicea? That's laos. Laity, people, Decia, Dikios, rights, people's rights, civil rights. Go ahead. Right. These things say at the eight. Kidding going up, is it? <laughs> You're going down. Up and down. Go ahead. Because thou sayest, I am rich. That's some church, isn't it? Poor, wretched, miserable, naked, and blind. So I put that arrow straight down. All right, then the church that kept the word of God was the church of the Reformation. And if you want to get the Word of God exactly as God wants you to have it, you will get you a Reformation Bible, is what you'll get. And since you're English-speaking people and speak English and study English, not American, English, you better get you an English Bible, and I don't mean American. Get you an English Bible. An authorized version is an English Bible. Somebody said, well, King James was effeminate, and King James fell off his saddle, and King James played tennis on Sunday. I know all that Roman Catholic garbage they put out. What's that got to do with it? Right. Bible said, well, the word of a king is, there's power, man. Book of Proverbs. You say, why did he pick King James? Well, he couldn't have picked Henry. He couldn't have picked Richard. He couldn't have picked George. I mean, after all, what name does James? Jacob. It's King Jacob. Every writer in that Bible is a Jew, man. The oracle is delivered to the Jews. And here's what they give you, they say to me, they say, well, Brother Ruffin, can't you read a person to Christ out of the Roman Catholic Bible? Sure you can. What's that got to do then? I need a man to Christ for this. That's not even a Bible. That's a cartoon book. See how folks are? I'm going to say, well, can't you read a man to Christ in ASC? Sure you can. You think that means it's the Bible? You need a man to Christ for the crap. That don't mean anything. Folks today, they're thinking this. Boy, I'll tell you, man, it's sick. Well, I told me, don't tell me one time. He said, you can find every one of the fundamentals of faith in this living Bible. I said, you can find a dollar bill in a sewer. <laughs> you, you got no business calling a sewer a bank just because you find dollar bills in it. Yeah, man, amen, brother, amen. I mean, I'm not, I'm not denying you can't find the fundamentals in those things. So what? See? We got a, the thinking that's peculiar. And uh, I'll tell you, like I said, I'm going to, by a lot of things, I'm very ignorant Comes to books. I'll push her all the way. I'll push her all the way. I studied 1,500 apparent contradictions in that Bible. 1,500 of them. That's King James. I never found one yet. Out of 1,500. 